And we're live. All right, guys. Uh, welcome to Cake. Uh, this week's topic. <laughs> this week's topic is going to be a revisit to the second cake that we ever did. We're kind of doing a um, uh, public service, getting all of these initial cakes that we did actually on film for the archives, um, and also revisiting them because now, after um, almost a full year of doing this. Um, I feel like we have some better perspective and to actually have to present information, what kind of things people are looking for. So, um, as always, uh, Cake is a donation-based workshop. We meet every Wednesday, um, every week since the beginning of the year. And the goal is to um, present really useful, kind of down and dirty techniques that uh, you can actually immediately implement to improve your business and hopefully make it better. Um, so less uh, up in the air abstract concepts and more um, just actually useful strategies um, and tactics. The, uh, the topic today, like I said, is a uh, is minimum viable product, and, um, or I, as I uh, subtitled it on here, cheap and dirty. Um, and uh, this is actually one of the main uh, topics, I guess, that uh, just comes up over and over again. Kind Should of. I bring some menus out? I already ordered. Okay. Yeah, I think we're fine. Yeah, Thanks. It'll be right up here. So, um, so this is one of the, uh, <laughs> yeah, a little real life interruption there. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the topics that just keeps coming up over and over again for a bunch of even the more advanced strategies that we do. So this is a really good one to, um, to actually have down. And um, uh, minimum viable product is uh, the, um, one of the backbone principles for the Lean Startup, um, which was a, a book and methodology written by Eric Reese, which is great. Um, anyone who hasn't read that should definitely go out and get a copy. It's a, it's a really good blueprint on just pretty much like how to start up a business um, from scratch without spending too much money and kind of just like adapting it as you go. Um, and uh, so this is going to be talking about that. And the basic idea behind the minimum viable product is just getting to the point um, really early in the process where you can actually get whatever it is that you're doing um, in its earliest, roughest, just like ugliest, uh, most janky forms that you can um, in front of customers. Um, and uh, the, uh, the benefit of that is that you get immediate feedback. And um, oh, some crazy stuff just happened in the room next door. Um, you get immediate feedback from the customers, which is great. And um, the, uh, what we're going to do today is actually kind of break down what um, the, like, all three of those things mean. The minimum part, the viable part, and then the, uh, the product part as well. Because I think all three, when you kind of break down and analyze them, are all really important to kind of getting this right. So um, to start off, the, uh, the minimum, like I said, is just kind of the roughest, ugliest, earliest form of something that you can put together. And um, the idea with that is just why waste time and money on something that you don't know whether you're actually going to be able to sell um, to your customers or whether it is sellable at all to anyone or who your customers are or what they even want or whether it solves any kind of problem that they have. Um, and the sooner that you get it in front of them, the rougher it is um, uh, just the, yeah, the earlier you get that feedback. And a good way to um, think of it too is just that the... Um, the solution to whatever problem they have, like their problem should be a, a burning problem, like this burning desire that they have to fix something or to add something to their life. And like, it doesn't matter if whatever you're producing is really ugly and if it's terrible, and it, but if it like actually does do a little bit to solve that problem, they will still be willing to pay you money for it and they will want to see it develop and they'll want to give you feedback. And if um, you just strike out and you haven't hit that, then you know that that core functionality that you thought was important that you put in and just ignored everything else. Um, wasn't uh, wasn't the core that they were actually interested in. You can kind of switch things around. And then also, like, if it's just terrible, even if you know that no one would buy whatever you're throwing in front of them, it's still just a great conversation piece because you can say, okay, well, like, what can I add to this to actually make it so you would pay money for it? Or, like, what would you like to see? Or what are your problems? And, uh, uh, yeah. Good question for you. If you really flunk out on a product, let's say you have a product that's a complete flop, okay? <laughs> and your name, or maybe the name of the business or LLC or whatever you established to do it, it was attached to this smarter than to, you know, pivot and find a new product or work the product to try and work on it and, and make it something you know, feedback can be sold? Or is it better to do a clean slate and dump the company, maybe start a whole new company with a whole new product? In other words, do you think it's, it's good to just do a complete whitewash of that, or is it worth keeping your same name attached to it even if you're going to change the product? Um, so that's a good question. The question was, if you do do this early stage product launch and just completely bombs and everyone hates it and they think that you're a terrible person for ever trying to do it, uh, do you abandon that company name? Do you just like completely rebrand and like ditch the website and ditch the URL and like ditch the LLC and go with something totally new? Or do you um, 
try to salvage it or just relaunch um, with the same name but do it different or right this time. Um, and there's actually, yeah, I've, uh, I've heard a couple different schools of thought on that. Um, I think it almost just comes down to personal preference, really. Um, the, I guess the, um, one of the more logical stances that I've seen is like, if you are not a big company, then failing doesn't really matter. Um, because the amount of people, like, if you're, like, a total failure, then that usually means you're not reaching very many people. Fail so, like, often, right? yeah, yeah. So, like, the, uh, the, the people who have seen you are, like, very few and might not even, you know, they probably won't even know again that you become a successful company until you are. And they're like, really? They came from that, like, shitty thing that I saw, like, you know, two years ago to, like, something that's actually, like, people love. And I don't think any of them are going to be like, no, 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 this isn't a valid company. They shouldn't be making millions because two years ago they showed me this thing and it was really bad. Um, and I think that's really, um, that's really pretty good. At the same time, like, it is also like, you know, you launch something under a company name, and there's also just kind of the personal psychological pressure that comes along with that, I think. Um, and if you've just totally bombed, you know, going back to your friends or like, going back to your relatives, especially if you're trying to raise early money or your early stage customers and saying like, hey, I'm doing the same kind of thing, but different and like better this time, I swear, um, can be kind of taxing. Um, so I'd say it just sort of depends on whatever takes the least amount of effort on your part. Um, or if you are a big company, like if you already do have like this pre-established brand, you know, like a ton of people know about you and then you totally bomb, like, yeah, ditch the company name probably and like rebrand yourself or release a giant apology letter to everyone, just figure out a way to make things right, you know. Um, but if you can't salvage the brand and you like, people are already aware of it, then yeah, I think it's, at some point you have to, I mean, that's usually like in big companies when they fire the CEO and hire a new one, they're like, it was their fault, we're a totally new company now, um, you know. Uh, so yeah, um, and if it takes more work to like form an entirely new LLC and do all this stuff, then I'd say just put the work in, yeah, drafting a good apology or explanation letter, throw it up publicly on your website and like out to your customers and then just like treat it like it never happened kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so the minimum part is actually pretty easy to understand conceptually, um, I think, like this idea of getting something that's really minimum uh, in front of your customers or in front of anyone really. Um, but uh, I find that a lot of uh, stumbling, like uh, kind of brushing through this stuff and in consulting that I've done now over the last year with other businesses, um, I think the best way to uh, kind of show it is just to give some real concrete examples of what that might look like in terms of um, actual minimum products that you can put in front of people. Um, so a good example that we use, um, or that we've used in other cakes uh, for things like uh, Saturday Market or anything, we have a lot of craftsy people who come through here, um, is like if you're making a t-shirt design or a clothing design or something like that, um, just making one-offs, like you can get iron-on t-shirt designs that you can just put down on like clothes and like go down to the Saturday market and just like put these little one-off designs up on a rack and have like three different designs up there and just see what people want to buy and when they go to buy it just say like, oh sorry, we sold out of that. Like you don't even need to have the t-shirts there to sell, all you need is those designs and like price tags and like throughout the day you can test different prices and like the cost of that is like you go to the bins and pick up three t-shirts for like 90 cents and whatever iron-on things are is like five dollars and you've just then like a fairly complicated product test for like price and for design and for color like you can test all sorts of things on like zero budget and then the cost of you know getting a booth at Saturday market or go up to last Thursday where it doesn't cost anything um, so that's like a very good example of a minimum viable product um, rather than trying to figure out what brand of t-shirt you're going to get how soft it's going to be you know those things can come later because design in the t-shirt example is really what you're trying to sell as its chief uh, chief function um, fake screenshots are really popular in like the tech industry as a really good example. So like, um, you know, taking screenshots of an early stage app where you're just like um, designing something that's going to be functional and you take screenshots of it um, is great as an early stage thing. But you don't even need screen like to have the actual app. You can like mock something up in Photoshop or pay someone to do that. Put a little like border of the browser around it and pretend that you have screenshots of the app and just say, you know, oh, we're developing this thing. You don't need to lie or say that you actually have it coded or anything like that. Just say like, hey, here's some like screenshots of my computer. We're developing this project. Um, great, you can just like skip spending all of the money on code and just went straight to seeing whether people would buy this thing were it made. And if they say no, like we want to see this kind of functionality, it's like great, you add in, you do some more screenshots, like send over those screenshots, like what about this? And then they're like, yeah, I would pay you for that. That's when you actually pay the programmers to sit down and start coding it out. Um, coming soon form is another classic that works for brick and mortar and for um, uh, online businesses, basically like throwing up like 10 different ideas and just saying, hey, this is coming soon, throw in your email address for more information. Um, or like if you're going around to um, conferences or taking out booths, you can do the exact same thing kind of in person and just say, hey, we're doing this thing, like come put down your information if you're interested and test out lots of different ideas or, um, you know, even at the, um, like there's a Mind, Body, Spirit Expo, which we went to with uh, Float On, which was its own, they had the best pet psychic of 2004 there, which is very exciting. Um, 
And uh, the. Uh, you think about that forever. You get that once. It's just. Like, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter if it's 2030, that's, that's still in the best of 2000. But, uh, but you. Um, yeah, like we could easily. Like there's so many people going in and out. We could easily have switched the like full on just what our booth was about every hour and had a whole new audience coming through that we could test ideas on. Like renting one booth, you could still test like two dozen different ideas and see if this like specific demographic is interested in signing up for them. Um, Google Ads and a landing page, classic. You just design some kind of random landing page that has text and a little image on it with a little sign-up form, and then you take out Google Ads with different kind of um, headlines. And this is great for testing info products, for consulting. You find out what people are actually willing to click on, and then what they're willing to enter their email address for as well. Next time I do a conference, I'm going to change my table throw in the middle and see if it changes the number of people who stop. That's a really fun idea. You definitely should. Fun. I just want to do that. Add testing to anything. Like as long as you're doing something, you might as well add like a second option for it and just test something because like. Yeah, like we have science, why not use it, you know? Um, start with a single customer. This is one that people overlook a lot too, which is like we're so eager to get a business that works, I think, um, that we forget that like in the end we're just going to be like on a case-by-case -case basis providing a product for a customer or providing a service for a customer. Like from their perspective, that one encounter is all that they have. They don't really care about all of the other hundreds or thousands of customers that you have coming through. It's like their experience. So. You can start small. Um, Eric Reese, it's in the Lean Startup, right, that he talks about the shopping, the like cooking, personal cook so, example yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, where he, uh, yeah, he gives a great example in that one of it, which is just, uh, it was a company that wanted to do, um, you could order, uh, you could enter your tastes basically and like um, have uh, someone go and pick up food for you and come to your house and cook it, like prepare meals for you or have prepared meals. Um, and the way that they tested that was by uh, just choosing a single customer and saying like, okay, great. And they'd like have a chef just like come in and like talk to the person and find out like really in depth what their tastes are, which eventually should be what the app does when they just kind of enter their tastes. Like the, the chef kind of logic should be built into the program, but for now it's just housed in a person. And like they'd come in and talk and then they'd have someone else go out and like buy a bunch of food and come back and like actually cook a meal for them and like ask them how the meal went and what they'd like different. Um, and like through that process, you just get to refine it so much and you go from that one customer to like, okay, well let's try this again now that we've refined it to like three customers and you refine it a little bit more, and then you launch to the thousand or whatever it is, and by that time you just already know that that's actually what real human beings are looking for. And the cost of starting that is like the cost of a few dinners that you're sucking up because they're paying you like, you know, $50 a month and you're spending like a couple hundred on this one thing, which, you know, isn't scalable, but the scale comes, comes later. Um, Craigslist is free, and you can test headlines on there really easily. We drilled that one home a lot in Cake, too. Um, just like throw a little counter on Craigslist sites and just throw up different headlines and see what gets people to click through. And once you figure out a popular headline, um, throw more text on there and try to get them to click through to a website. And once you have the text figured out to click through, through to a website, like throw up a landing page and then have them and you just sort of like slowly increase your funnel. And like every step of the funnel should be more benefits that you're providing. And you can just kind of like scale up from having like a almost like completely blank Craigslist page, like just a headline. They click on it, there's nothing there except a counter and they're like, oh. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> um, and there's really good cake too on um, copywriting and how to write um, specifically uh, good Craigslist ads um, as well on there, which is a good one to go back and review. Um, place products in stores. There's a lot of companies that do this, especially books and bookstores, um, but even just like throwing your product on a shelf in a pre-existing store, which I'm not sure the legality of that, so don't, I'm not actually encouraging you to do <laughs> that if you that's... Are sure <laughs> Um, good stores that'll appreciate it with their consent. Um, but uh, and, I mean, the worst that happens is they, I guess, go up to the register and try to buy something. They're like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on here. Um, but uh, Timothy Ferris did that with his book, which is another example I love. It's just such a concise um, example of that one, which is he, uh, to test his covers, different cover ideas, he just went into a bookstore with pre-designed covers and wrapped them around other books and then set them up on a table and just sat in a chair and watched like how many people pick, picked up each cover and then just went with the cover that the most people picked up. Um, and like the book, and he hadn't even written the book yet. Like he just wanted to design, yeah, the cover for it. Um, so yeah, actually just placing something to get feedback in a store. Um, an early stage doesn't even have to be like, yeah, an empty cardboard box that looks like a product, but is not into seeing who. Consumer issues there. Video. Um, Kickstarter is really good at showing how well video works for just early descriptions of things. Um, and I think that's because video also captures this human aspect. 
um, which is also something we encourage with the early stage. Like, as long as you're doing things rough and dirty, like, really own up to it. Like, there's no reason that you need to pretend that you're this, like, finished, polished product or that you're really far along or anything. Like, you can, the more you reveal the process and what you're going through, especially if it's intelligent, like, oh, we're starting really early and launching this so we can get feedback so that we can make it better really early. Like, people eat that up. Like, they want the story. And video is a really good way to um, convey that, too, without, I mean, that takes, like, five minutes of sitting in front of a camera just talking about something. Like, the cost on that is so low these days. Um, and if you want a good tip on just immediately making video um, production seem way higher, um, audio quality has a lot to do with it. Like, the two things that, uh, like, audio and lighting are the two things that will make video look good, even with a low-quality camera. Um, and ideal audio, like this guy, is $99 and captures complete four channel surround sound. What really good. Oh, sorry, sorry. There, if it's, if you want to what? Oh, this guy, yeah. So this guy, um, it's a Zoom, um, Zoom 2, I think it is? Zoom 4. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it's a four channel audio thing. It's $99 on Amazon. Um, great sound quality. You can even pick up like people talking in a round table around it or one on one interviews. Um, super great. That'll immediately make your video quality way higher. What do you think on the written article on like a blog as opposed to a video blog and, you know, I mean maybe it's unfair to ask you since apparently you've already made this decision to a certain extent, but uh, what do you think about that? Do you think you get more from doing video blogging than you would from writing articles? Um, so you can think of, uh, well, so there's, there's a couple different things like, um, Video, if you're putting it up, which um, we don't do because we're not trying to produce a ton of like hits to this thing, I guess, right now. Like, we haven't really publicized this, but when we decide to and when we release this, um, we'll be uh, doing um, uh, transcriptions of all of these okay. um, because then they can actually get all of that keyword search. It actually produces content. Um, so that's what an article immediately does that video does not if you're not doing transcriptions um, as it puts it in a way that search engines can find it. Um, I think a combination is great. I mean, honestly, like uh, a good way of putting it is that uh, like video games do an actually really, really good job of this, which is nowadays in games, you see a ton of different reward systems. Like the games are really pretty for people who just want the visual experience and you have different difficulty settings so you can scale up and down. And then you have like rewards built into the game, you know, like uh, that just get shared with other friends that you're playing with online. Like, oh, you unlocked this achievement or you beat this level on this difficulty and it like gives you a little badge. And then there's weird little Easter eggs that you can find around for if you're really into games, just want to go through every single part of it. Um, but the point is just people want um, different things out of their experiences. And um, so like some people will find video way more compelling and some people will find written articles way more compelling. And um, it takes more time, but the more you can um, hit every single one of those, the better you're going to do in the long run, I think. It sounds like you need to do a cake on gamification at some point, too. Oh, man. I think so much about gamification of things. <laughs> Which uh, has a little Easter egg to watching this video this far through. If you go to monkeybusinessgame.com, you'll find an interesting one productivity game that Ashcon and I designed. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, more expensive one-offs. So that's kind of like we talked about with the chef thing or like doing the t-shirts with the iron-ons. I'm just doing one-offs of even products rather than services. Um, works really well as a minimum viable um, product. Um, <laughs> this is probably my favorite one, which I saved for our last, which was, uh, uh, I actually had known about this before, but found three terms for it recently, which were um, manualation, uh, wiz uh, Wizard of Oz, um, or um, Flintstoning something, uh, which is basically when you, um, yeah, when you plan on having something automated later on, like this, uh, like the chef program, and you're just doing, so like in the meantime, though, you are personally doing that. It would be akin to um, like uh, saying like, oh yeah, we have like uh, cars for sale on this website. And uh, we'll totally hook up people who want to sell cars with people who buy them based on these preferences. And, like, people submit forms on both sides, and then, like, you just get them in and personally go through and, uh, like, sort through them and say, like, oh, I bet this person Juno really liked this car. Juno can beers. Yeah, I think we're fine for now. Did you get that water? I can bring a picture of them before. Thanks. Um, so, uh, yeah, manualation. Basically, like, uh, it costs less for the final product when something's automated, but getting it to that automation point is going to cost you a lot. So in the meantime, just to test it, you are the automation point. Like, there's just a Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. It's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You're just back there doing everything that the program or that your service or that your staff should eventually be doing. Um, and that's honestly, like, that one um, kind of term, I guess, is at the heart of a lot of these different ones as well. Um, so that's the minimum part. Um, viable. We're going to talk now about what it means to be a viable, a viable product. So minimum, just like, yeah, fast, as dirty as possible. Um, viable... It still has to be something um, that works. 
uh, or at least something that uh, is presented enough that the customer can understand how it will work or how you want it to work or more importantly what they're going to get out of it. Um, so uh, I wrote down a couple different examples on the worksheet and then we'll talk a little bit more um, generally about it. But um, so for instance, uh, like uh, if you are doing that fake uh, screenshot, right, and you're like designing uh, just a web page in, um, in Photoshop and you haven't actually taken the time to program it out, um, you still want a screenshot of your app um, and of what the functionality is going to be, like of the screens that people are actually going to be using and what it's going to provide. Um, you don't want a screenshot of like your sales and pricing page or your home page or really any of those front-facing things because that doesn't, that's not a viable product. Like showing your homepage to someone does not show them what your product is actually going to do for them. Um, showing like a fake screenshot of your product shows them that. Um, so there's kind of a, a distinction. Or the, the same one, we talked about it a little bit with the, um, the t-shirt idea. Um, like having, um, having t-shirts up at the Saturday market with like um, a little sketch on the table of what design will eventually go on the t-shirts. Um, or even like the t-shirts which is kind of a hand-drawn sketch on them of what the design will look like. Um, is not really viable because what you're trying to determine there, what you're selling eventually is the t-shirt design and is that finished product. Um, so while you might want to skimp on um, quality of the fabric or something else early on, make sure that design is right though so that you can actually get feedback on that. Um, or conversely, if what you're actually trying to sell with the t-shirt is just its softness or you're, you're like doing some kind of new production of thread or whatever it is or like the vibrancy of colors that you can produce then you don't care about design. Like, you should go with that and make sure that, that one t-shirt that you do have is really soft and actually shows off what you want it to. Or that if you're, like, whoever you have writing your copy is good enough at describing what softness feels like, that the person can really picture it. Um, so when you, when you have a service, what's, what's a viable service when you think about it? Um, so viable is, I mean, you just have to actually be in a position where um, someone will find... Uh, what you're providing useful. So um, uh, consulting, um, for example, like uh, a useful version of like minimum consulting is really just putting up, I mean to me like the easiest thing is put up a Craigslist ad and just see people who like come in like offer a half an hour free consulting and be like, how was that? Um, or a good way to offer free services um, that I've found, and this is another little, uh, little cake, just, uh, a cute strategy, is um, put down what you eventually plan on charging for something and then say that you're providing it free for the first however many people um, in exchange for um, extensive reviews and um, like testimonials, like a video testimonial, like and a, like three different stages of reviews throughout the process or something like that. Um, and what that does is it um, like establishes your baseline um, and it makes them, whoever gets the free service, feel like they're actually getting something really good for free. And then it doesn't devalue your product to anyone because they're, they're actually providing something in exchange for it. Yeah, um, so that's like, so good, I mean, that's like just actually literally a really good minimum viable product for um, consulting. Um, and once again, what you want to put the Craigslist ad there on for is actually like the consulting that you'll be offering. And the closer you can come to with um, anything early on to actually providing um, utility, like in your actual ad that you post up, if you can give them something that people will immediately find useful, that's going to be so much better than just talking about yourself and your qualifications. Um, you want to skip straight to the utility and less about like why something's going to be useful. Um, show don't tell, I guess, is uh, is another way of, of putting that. Um, and I'm trying to think of what an unviable option for like trying to like uh, like initially um, do consulting stuff is. Um, I guess like yeah, really talking about your experience or talking about specifically your um, your talking experience would be like a kind of non-viable one. Like, um, I, like, I'm qualified for this consulting not because I'm an expert in the field, but because I'm an expert at communicating about things. Might not be, like, the um, direction you... <laughs> yeah, um, so that, uh, yeah, it's kind of a weak, unviable one, but I, yeah, Sorry, it's a little, yeah. Um, and, uh... It says the BS meter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I know I'm not really qualified for it by my experience, but we have to understand that I have this other experience. I'm really skilled at just translates right across the BS meter. Right, and since that's not something people are paying for, it's not viable. So, yeah. I have interns trying to do that to me, and I'm like, that's why you're an idiot. And the last part is the product part, um, which is that you need to be able, as early on as possible, to actually sell what it is that you're making, um, or be able to sell it when you're ready to. Uh, so... Um, like if you go the single customer route and you're just like catering this person, make sure they're a single paid customer still. 
uh, make sure that you got to the point where they were willing to pay you money to do this like personal catering thing with them. Um, and hopefully they'll be willing to stay on and keep paying you. And if they're not, then that's a really good sign. Like, because people will tell you all kinds of things, like both good and bad about whatever it is. And like in the end, you're trying to start a business. And that means that you need to have some kind of income flow. And the sooner you figure out what people are willing to open their wallet and pay you for, like, the much less painful it'll be later on. There's so many stories of so many companies that, like, figure out and people are so excited about it and using their thing. And as soon as they throw even, like, a $1 to $5 little, like, um, price barrier on there, completely drops off and they just cannot get anyone to go for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's even, like, if you get them to say, like, even if someone says, I will pay you for this, um, it's not as good as getting them to actually hand you money. And the closer you can get to that, the earlier, the better. Um, and so that's what, to me, the being a product part is. Is like you're not just creating something that's like small and viable and useful. You also are like actually getting into that product stage where people will pay you. Um, and Square is awesome. They have a great interface. I've been um, actually, I've been, we've been looking for payment processors for um, a couple different projects that we're working on. So I've been talking to a lot of them. And Square, if you ever decide to do business partnerships, contact us. We really like you. Um, but I've been talking to different um, cafes and just different food carts and stuff who are using Square and just asking them how they like it, whether they're using it on the iPhone or the iPad or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Everyone I talk to just like actually really, really likes it. Um, Um, there's one in Portland called Swipe Now. Swipe Now. Yep, um, which we're looking into. Um, and uh, then there's um, uh, I mean, so the authorized.net is like the you know kind of like big one to go through for a lot of different things. Um, yeah, exactly. And Swipe Now is like a merchant of authorized, um, but they can get lower rates sometimes because they're not paying for the huge overhead of actually going through authorized. And then um, the one for developers. I know. I'm trying. It wasn't. Stripe? I think it's Stripe. Yeah, Stripe was the other one that we were looking at, which is for specifically, like, I think um, Ruby on Rails yeah, developers. Stripe? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, which um, we're, we're doing kind of a... a I know there are a couple online places that do, for strictly credit cards, do comparisons of merchant fees. It's like Fee Ninja or something like that, or do you remember? <laughs> um, yeah, if you just do, like, fee comparisons and look that up on Google, yeah, you'll find some good ones. Um, but yeah, Square, um, Square is great. They actually charge better rates than a lot of ones that are out there. Um, and their, uh, their options actually even just recently got even better. You can kind of pay a flat rate up to like 200 something thousand a year of like 200 something a month. So like if you know kind of where you fall, you can actually save a lot of more money doing that. So if you're a small business, maybe some better options. Yep, exactly. If you're kind of like... Normally uh, you get penalized for being a small business with most merchants. Right, and like small business for most people is like under like 10 or 15 million. So like this is like kind of like a, yeah... <laughs> mid-sized like small yeah business or like a yeah small small um but something like pretty much if you land i think between like a hundred and two hundred thousand a year um somewhere in that range i forget exactly the calculations so double check me but um then you end up saving a decent amount of money with this new option that square introduced as well which is really cool um they also have great launch strategies and great minimum viable products and great getting things out there too they're actually a really interesting company to uh, to look into and follow um Get companies to, like, um, although getting that money from them is really important, um, getting companies to say that they would pay you for your product if it existed um, is really good, too. And companies, for some reason, that word is some, like, a little more solid, almost, than, like, just finding a consumer who's like, oh, yeah, I'd buy that if you made it. Um, like, if you're sitting down in, 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 like, an actual meeting and say, like, okay, so if I fulfill this, 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 and this, and it looks like this, like, you would pay me this much money, um, is, like, an actual decent commitment that you can get from people. Um, and you can do all of that before you've ever designed a single thing. Like um, one of the earliest uh, entrepreneurship classes that I went to, the guy was talking about people who were designing um, giant CAT scan machines um, like that. And they basically went around to these hospitals and sold the idea of the difference in the CAT scan machines that they wanted to, like they had an engineering team and they were like, okay, we have this team of engineers who says that they can build this thing. Would you pay for it if it did this? And they had this whole list of features and the guys are like, yeah, yeah, totally. And they're like, okay, well, which ones could you do without? And just started cutting down all of those, like, product features down to a few core ones. Then ran, went around to more hospitals and, like, basically got, like, yeah, if you design that within the next six months, we'll totally pay this amount of money for it. And they're like, okay, here's our budget. And they just took all of that to investors and just said, look, we have a guarantee from these companies saying they will pay us this much money. We have a team of engineers that says they will build it. Like, let's do this. I mean, 
mean, it still shows that big difference because we see many more um, business to consumer than we do business to business, despite there being a huge business to business market. Business to business. Mm -hmm. um, but to productize something business to business, it seems like a longer chain. At least from what I've seen, it seems like if you want to do business to business, you need to have more capital to see you through until you exit. Yeah. And so I guess that's the idea is like even with something as complicated as business to business, you really don't need more capital. Like these guys, um, and uh, if you want to look him up, um, I'm forgetting, I'm spacing on his name. He actually, it was great. Um, the Lean Startup um, by Eric Reese was actually based on um, Four Steps to the Epiphany um, by uh, this other fellow. Um, they were saying like when they were developing their stuff, um, he was just walking around with this copy of Four Steps to the Epiphany. And when he, like he came in and talked in my entrepreneurship class, and like I had a kind of like this early stage like really crazy version of Four Steps to the Epiphany from like six months I think before it was even published. That like that was how I learned entrepreneurship, and I'm like, oh no wonder I've been doing this lean stuff for freaking ever. Um, but uh, yeah, Four Steps to the Epiphany, great, great, great. It's just like a this thick like page by page, hold your hand walkthrough of how to do customer development and how to start from like selling and just like making these meetings and going and finding what people want before you ever like build anything. Um, pretty dense, but like really, really good. Great. I'd love to have more examples of you know, short chain <laughs> examples I can give to people just for my quick or uh, see why people take way too long or they can't see it through when they go over the Absolutely. Road. And that, that was pretty much his, uh, so yeah, just, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about this anyway, um, about customer development. Um, which I, yeah, let me finish up with the product part and I'll get back to that in a second actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, actually I already talked about that. So product, just get, yeah, get people paying for things early on. Um, almost every single, whether it's an online or whether it's an in-person merchant who's been like designing clothes for their friends or just now starting to sell it on Etsy or yeah, someone who's been like hosting a forum and like just out of love for like years and years that has thousands of people and just now decided to charge like $5 a month for people who want to be a part of it. Like every one of them says, I wish I had charged earlier. Like, charging, it's, like, kind of scary to throw up, like, an actual price on something, especially when you're transitioning from doing something out of love to doing something for kind of a business or to try to make a living. But the soon, like, you just get so much more feedback. What people are willing to spend money on is actually their vote of confidence in you, and you just get actual meaningful, meaningful feedback with it. One person who was in that situation, what they did is they tried asking for donations on their fan site. They didn't get any, so they said, oh, I'm sorry, then I guess we don't have enough money to keep doing this. They closed down the fan site, and they opened up a business, you know, with a business day. It didn't really sound like their day, but then started offering basically the same thing with 4FB, and everybody was just like, oh my god, you know, our, our jack was pulled out, and we need this. And they went and they paid it's a business, even though they weren't willing to donate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And people are willing to pay, and it really does separate the people who are really kind of like just leeching, and maybe even not getting that much value out of what you're doing, and the people who really are getting a distinct value. And your conversations become that much better when you're asking for meaningful feedback from people who are giving you money. Like, they're so much more likely to say, like, this is what I'd like better for my money, rather than like, oh, it'd be nice if I had this thing and this thing. Um, so that's it. So minimum, you know, keep it rough and ugly. Viable, it has to actually be something that, like, is useful to someone and a product, hopefully it's something that uh, you can find out if they can pay for and do that earlier rather than later. Um, and then just a couple words too on the customer development process, because I think that's a really great minimum viable product because it just starts with conversations. Um, and uh, basically you can get meetings with almost, like not, not anyone, but like any representative of a company at least, if you're going like business to business especially. Um, consumers too, like take out a Craigslist ad and just be like, hey, I'm developing this cool thing and I want feedback on it and like people will hop on board or just like release it to your friends. But you can start these conversations so early and um, the like, just treat it like an actual schedule, like for your day, like you're going in for a day at the office, which is also a hard thing I think for early entrepreneurs to really like get that productivity cycle going. But like set aside your schedule with like two hour time blocks and just like start booking it in like a month from now to say like, okay, great. I have two weeks of like two hour meetings, just like the solid week with just like clients and just start like booking them all in. And then like you go through that and then you actually have these over and over again, like eight hours a day of like two hour, like just four conversations a day with different clients. And like, it's amazing what happens as a result of that. Like by the end of that couple of weeks, like you know what everyone actually wants and what people like think they want, but they don't actually and what they're willing to let go of. And so you can, really think of you as well. yeah, right. <laughs> um, but you can go in there without anything except like a list of ideas. And of course, the more fleshed out, you know, the closer you get to that, like even fake screenshot, or if you have a demoable app, like the further along you get, the better. But you can go in with like a sheet of note paper and just like have something awesome to say. And if you don't, like great. So you don't get a, like an appointment with that company again under your current business name, or like you don't, and you send a sales rep over there later. But um, 
yeah, and that whole idea is like find out what people want before you build it because you will waste so much, like so many people have wasted so many man hours and so much money on things that flopped during their first day of launching. Um, and it's because they didn't do this, like they didn't find out what people actually wanted and weren't willing to build it along as an organic process. They just wanted to like throw a ton of money and effort to it up front. Um, and uh, we've talked about this before too um, in Cake, but a kind of reiterated history lesson too is that that comes from a necessity. Like we used to be in an age when production of things took more time and took more money and um, when it was impossible to actually launch a business without capital to start. And um, as technology progresses further and further, now we have printers in our house and we can print books. We have Amazon Create Space where I have a 180 page color book that I can just pay um, a fair, like half of our retail price for. Um, and one off prints, I don't even need to order in bulk of like 10 or anything and it's the exact same price if I order one or 100. Um, same for like CD manufacturing, like you can do like the cost of yeah getting screenshots uh, up and sending that over to someone or making a sketch and having like paying two hundred dollars to a dis freelance designer to just mock it up for I, you. I've is got a guy now who sells three D printer designs. And it's just it's incredible. We're gonna be able to print stuff like actual stuff. Oh my goodness, three D printers are gonna be amazing for minimum viable products. Um, but it's so easy, and like historically, we're still teaching the same kind of business methodologies a lot of people are for a bygone age, and it's really silly. Um, and I think the name of the game now is like, yeah, launch fast and launch rough because we can. And that didn't used to be the case and we might as well take advantage of it. Um, so that's it. That's our cake on minimum viable product. You guys are great. <laughs> um, and uh, feel free to, uh, to toss a little uh, money into our box slash donate online as well. Um, we have a uh, link to PayPal button until Square gets their online payment up and running um, and works out their business development. Square, we're watching you. Um, tune in next week. Um, we'll be continuing to tackle some early stage, uh, early stage business, and then we'll be back, um, not on camera, but uh, here in person for a workshop um, after maybe a little 10-minute break. All right, thanks, guys.